Good day. We're delighted you've joined us to the first of three webinars that explore the National Social Life Health and Aging Project. As we intend to show you, NCHAP data have fueled highly impactful research in the clinical and medical arenas, as well as in the social sciences. And we want to entice you to take advantage of these data in your own research. NCHAP has a highly collaborative, multidisciplinary team. And I have to have some problems. There we go. Under the able and effective leadership of Dr. Linda Waite. Broadly speaking, the primary aim of NCHAP is to understand how, in Teresa Siemens terminology, the social world gets under the skin to affect health. This is a bi-directional association, and we can also ask how do health and illness affect social functioning? Other examples of the types of research questions that can be asked are, does experiencing discrimination increase risk for inflammation? Does cognitive limitation damage social relationships? Can poor hearing increase loneliness? All of these questions can be answered thanks to the kinds of data that NCHAP obtains. They're in a variety of donate domains, and I'll give you an example of each. So in the social domain, NCHAP is exceptional among national surveys in obtaining a social network roster that permits quantifying social network size and relationship quality with network members. NCHAP also probes other aspects of social relationships, such as the number of friends and close relatives, the support and strain experienced in relationships with others. Um, social participation includes the frequency with which participants socialize, take part in voluntary group meetings, attend religious services, and volunteer. NCHAP also provides wide-ranging data on the sexual attitudes and behaviors of older adults, an area that is rarely explored in large national surveys of older adults. In the health domain, NCHAP includes self-reported measures of, for example, physical and mental health, ADLs, IADLs, and reports of doctor-diagnosed chronic conditions. In addition, NCHAP developed and has deployed a range of performance measures under the advisement of clinician consultants. These include tests of physical functioning, such as gait speed and chair stands, and cognition, which you will hear more about in today's session. NCHAP also obtains a complete medication inventory and blood tests for HbA1c, hemoglobin A1c, and CRP, among other analytes and objective assessments of all five senses, and you will hear more about these in subsequent sessions. NCHAP's conceptual or contextual and uh, lifespan approach to health is evident in measures of childhood experiences, employment, income, and wealth, and in respondent perceptions and interviewer assessments of the household and the neighborhood. NCHAP also probes respondents about their attitudes on a range of topics and obtains assessments of the big five personality traits. NCHAP started in 2005 with 57 to 85 year olds born from 1920 to 1946. We've been back every five years to re-interview these folks. In 2010 to 11, we added partners or spouses of, of these respondents. And in 2015 to 16, we added a new cohort, born 1947 to 65. Our scheduled 2020 collection has not transpired as planned, but then again, what has during the pandemic? But we will resume in 2021. As you can assume or gather that this panel design just increases the value with NCHAP, of NCHAP with each additional wave of data. Our webinars, and this, as I mentioned, is a three webinar series. Our webinars will take this general format. We'll begin with two presentations, some applied data analysis discussion, and a question and answer session. I want to start by teasing you about the sessions that are following. So on October 15th, Drs. Jay Pinto and Martha McClintock will present research on sensory functioning and the remote assessment of biological and performance measures in NCHAP. On December 14th, Drs. Dima Cato and Albert Huang will present research on medication data and the next generation of dried blood assessment in NCHAP. 
But in today's session, we will have Drs. Ashwin Cotwell and Megan Heising Sheets presenting research on cognitive function, physical function, and accelerometry in engine. I'm going to begin by introducing the last speaker on the panel, because his role on NSHAP makes all of our work possible. Phil Schum is an NSHAP investigator who has been involved with the project since its inception. He is a statistician, assistant director of the Biostatistics Laboratory, and director of the Research Computing Group in the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Chicago. He is responsible for developing and implementing statistical approaches to the analysis of NSHAP data, as well as the preparation and maintenance of the public data set. It is his work that will make it easier for you to navigate and use the data. Uh, Phil Schum will speak on how to actually use data on topics of interest to you. And I will also mention that Jen Hannes will be on the panel, not on the panel, but will assist at the end as a question moderator. She has worked with NSHAP for eight years and is director of NSHAP Communications. Dr. Cotwell is what I call a child of NSHAP. He is a, was a medical student at the University of Chicago Medical School where he worked as a research assistant with Dr. William Dale, a geriatrician and NSHAP investigator. He took a year to get a Master of Science in Biostatistics and wrote NSHAP papers while a medical student and then as a resident at Brigham and, Young and Women's. He has continued working with NSHAP data as an assistant professor at UCSF including two years as an NSHAP fellow. Dr. Megan Heising Sheets is a geriatrician and clinician investigator at the University of Chicago in the section of geriatrics and palliative medicine. As a clinician, she helped establish the successful aging and frailty evaluation or SAFE clinic in which she routinely administers functional and frailty measures to improve clinical decision-making and management. As a clinician investigator, she studies how wearable sensors, that is accelerometers, and smart voice can help advance clinical frailty assessment and management. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to our first speaker, Dr. Cotwell. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Louise, for the very kind introduction. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, being part of the NSHAP team over the last decade or so. Um, and uh, today I'll be discussing the use of the cognitive function measure in NSHAP, um, also known as the Survey Adapted Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or MOCA SA. Um, so uh, for NSHAP, we use the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or MOCA, as our starting framework due to its assessment of multiple cognitive domains, its ability to detect milder degrees of cognitive impairment, uh, and its reliability and validity in clinical settings. So many clinicians uh, may be familiar with this test and have administered this in the outpatient setting, but if you're not familiar, the MOCA includes 28 items uh, representing six cognitive domains, executive function, visuospatial skills, language, attention, concentration, and working memory, orientation, and short-term memory. So um, based off of, uh, so we administered the MOCA in several phases. The first way, phase uh, included cognitive interviewing, where we uh, solicited uh, feedback from participants on how to uh, alter the format to improve its administration in a survey setting. And so this in, included rewording of uh, some of the questions, and administration instructions for improved understanding. We reordered items from the original one-page format, um, and we modified the layout to be compatible with computer-based survey administration using CAPI technology. We also tried to minimize the number of items scored by interviewers in the field so that they were blindly scored later by trained personnel applying a standardized scoring protocol. So this uh, was our attempt to improve data quality and reproducibility. Um, in the next phase, we administered uh, the reformatted uh, MOCA to a pretest, uh, an NSHAP pretest sample to refine the administrative technique and facilitate item selection. Um, and we set five criteria for selecting a subset of items. The first is uh, 
uh, reducing administration time. We wanted to reduce it from 16 to 12 minutes um, to fit in our omnibus uh, national survey. Uh, the second is uh, pre preservation of questions from each of the six cognitive domains. Third, we uh, preferentially included difficult items in each domain to ensure discrimination of cognition in a relatively high functioning population. Fourth, uh, we eliminated items that were difficult to administer in the field. And lastly, we wanted to ensure high correlation between the shortened form and the full scale. Um, so after selection of items, we uh, determined whether the shortened MOCA essay could be reliably administered in a large scale survey and examined its psychometric properties, which I'll show in the next couple of slides. So our final measure was an uh, was 18 items and it ranged zero to 20 points. Um, that was taken down from the 28 uh, original items and then met our five criteria that we previously laid out. So you can see on the left, each of the domains in different colors with corresponding items. On the right-hand side, uh, it shows results of um, an item response model um, that we use to understand the scale of psychometrics. So we conducted a one parameter item response model, also known as a RASH model. Um, and you can see uh, the histogram showing the estimated cognitive abilities in the full NCHAP sample and the corresponding item difficulties for each selected item grouped by color of the domain spanning the x-axis. Uh, the key takeaway from this figure is that item difficulties of selected items uh, spanned the broad range of cognitive abilities. In addition, we found that our survey adapted version was highly correlated with the full MOCA in two separate samples, an NSHAP pretest sample and an outpatient geriatrics clinical sample known as the SAFE clinic uh, uh, that uh, is at the University of Chicago. So we were able to create an equation to accurately convert MOCA SA scores to equivalent MOCA scores, um, which performed uh, similarly in these two independent samples as shown on the figure uh, on the right. So in this figure, it shows that there are relatively narrow forecast intervals uh, for predicting um, full MOCA scores um, and that there was a simil uh, similar performance of our conversion equation in these two independent samples. So regarding its use in analyses, and um, uh, Phil Schum will uh, talk about this more, but we suggest two options. The first is it can be examined as a continuous measure ranging zero to 20 points. Uh, and fortunately, there is minimal missing data within the NSHAP sample for the cognitive measure. The second uh, is for clinical research, we have found it can be helpful to frame the measure using clinical cutoffs, reflecting a positive screen for normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment, or dementia. And this involves converting uh, to full MOCA scores on a zero to 30 point range and using suggested cutoffs uh, for community-based samples based off of previously published normative data. Um, uh, I will mention though, it is worth doing robustness checks and analyses uh, because there's no clearly appropriate cutoff for the MOCA. And it's important to recognize that uh, this uh, measure is not a substitute for a medical diagnosis. So next, uh, I'll briefly turn to applications to clinical research where this cognitive measure was used. Um, the first study was published in the Journal of uh, General Internal Medicine um, and is uh, entitled Social Function and Cognitive Status. The goal of this study was to determine the association of multiple domains of social functioning uh, with the MOCA essay. So this study will allow me to illustrate several social measures available in NSHAP that were brought up by Louise and its relation to a categorical version of the cognitive measure. So in this study, we included six social measures, um, which I'll go through one by one. So the first is we measured social network size, where we asked respondents to name up to five members they discussed important matters with in the last year. Um, so this me method uh, has been shown to elicit the number of influential individuals in a respondent's life. So for example, in, um, in this first individual represented by the blue circle, they have a network size of three, um, the second individual has a size of four, and the fifth individual has a size of five. Second, we measured network density, which describes how close-knit a respondent's social context is. And this is a summary measure of three components, 
Um, the first is the volume of contact with network members. So you can see individual two has, uh, and three, they have higher volumes of contact with certain network members. Second, uh, the number of network members that know one another, illustrated by these dashed lines. And then third, uh, the volume of contact between network members. So density values are continuous uh, between a range of zero and one, where a value of one indicates that all possible pairs of network members have the maximum contact, and a value of zero indicates zero, no contact between any of the possible pairs of network members. So here are some example values that you might see um, uh, based on this uh, measure. We measured community engagement, a summary measure of volunteering, religious activity, and uh, participation in community groups, as well as socializing with friends and neighbors. Uh, and then we measured uh, perceived social support and social strain. Um, the cognitive measure that we used, we grouped uh, and to screened as normal MCI and dementia. So what were the key findings? So the first was we found that network members uh, seemed to drop off even at early stages of mild cognitive impairment. Um, second, we found that networks were more dense at higher levels of cognitive, uh, cognitive impairment. So why might this be? We hypothesized that lower cognition may hinder the maintenance of diverse and distant network ties. Um, and alternatively, there may um, be some compensatory changes in network structures uh, in response to cognitive difficulties where, um, where networks might become more tight-knit uh, in order to support individuals who are experiencing cognitive decline. We found that individuals with increasing cognitive impairment perceived less social support and less social strain. And lastly, we found that community engagement and socializing declined with increasing levels of impairment. Um, and I'll just point out um, that this is in contrast to community involvement, which tends to increase for individuals at older ages, as shown on the right. So taken together, these findings were able to comprehensively describe the social functioning of older adults at different potentially clinically important levels of cognitive function. Um, the second study I'll uh, show uh, was published uh, just recently in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, um, and uh, it's entitled The Integration of an Objective Cognitive Assessment into a Prognostic Index for Five-Year Mortality Prediction. So um, measures of cognition are rarely included in clinical prognostic indices because of a lack of epidemiologic data, including clinically relevant measures. So, the goal of this study was really to determine if the MOCA essay could improve mortality predictions of a widely used prognostic index. Um, in NCHAP, we were able to include a modified version of the Lee prognostic index, which was originally developed in the uh, health and retirement study and includes 12 items. Um, show, so our modified version in NCHAP included the 12 items um, seen here, age, sex, BMI, tobacco use, um, certain medical conditions, as well as measures of geriatric function. Um, we, uh, again, use the MOCA SA. We use both a, a categorical version as well as a continuous version. And the key findings, we found that the MOCA SA was strongly associated with five-year mortality. Um, so here are the unadjusted and adjusted probabilities of five-year mortality at different point thresholds of the MOCA SA. Uh, and adjustments were for uh, all of the items in the Lee Index, as well as race and education. So you can see there's uh, nearly a 20% absolute mortality difference between the lowest ranges and the highest ranges. The second is we showed that the Lee Index performed well and extremely similarly to its original development and validation cohorts in HRS. You can see on the left is um, a table showing similar mortality predictions at uh, different point thresholds. Um, and the continuously prognostic index predicting mortality um, quite strongly. And then lastly, we found that the MOCA SA significantly improved Lee index mortality predictions. So on uh, the left-hand side, um, here is the Lee index alone, and then stratified by screen cognitive status, um, there was quite a substantial difference um, in these uh, mortality predictions. So for example, among those in the lowest Lee index scores, 
um, there was a 7% absolute mortality difference in mortality rates, um, so 0.2% to 7%. Um, and similarly, a 15% mortality difference um, in this green cognitive groups in the middle um, uh, Lee index uh, category. And um, on the right-hand side, you can see this demonstrated in a more continuous way. Uh, so taken together, this study demonstrated the ability of the MOCA essay to improve mortality predictions in a widely used prognostic measure. And um, the cognitive measure has been used in a number of unique ways in the NSHAP data, including uh, examining sexuality, uh, marital dyads, and uh, its association with sleep characteristics, uh, all il illustrating its wide utility. Um, and uh, I'll just mention briefly that in the, uh, moving forward, the MOCA assay will be administered in wave four, and there are plans for additional cognitive measures and remote data collection. And I'll, I'll let the group uh, speak to a little bit more detail about future data collection. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn our panel over to uh, uh, the next speaker. Thank you, Ashwin. Are my slides viewable right now? I can't tell. I can't tell. I think so. Um, so thank you, Ashwin. That was a great overview of the cognitive measures and social measures. Um, my name again is Megan Heising. I am a geriatrician um, and clinician and investigator at the University of Chicago. Um, as Louise mentioned, my research is largely centered around studying uh, frailty and sort of the use of various technologies to improve our assessments and management of frailty. Um, and NCHEP has proved to be a very useful data set for me in my research path. And I would love to give you a little overview of the physical function and accelerometry measures in NCHEP now. So a little bird's eye view of the functional measures in NCHAP over the last three waves is shown here. Um, NCHAP included many of the elements that we would find as clinicians valuable to a functional history. They included um, an assessment of disability in activities and instrumental activities of daily living uh, across waves. They include uh, an, an objective physical function performance measures in, in waves, although these have changed slightly uh, over time. And they include uh, a number of elements critical to um, calculating or estimating frailty status in older adults across waves. Um, in the 2010 a, a wave, NCHEP introduced a research grade accelerometer. Um, and that has continued to be administered in subsequent waves that the device has changed. Um, Megan, so may I interrupt, please? We aren't able to see your slides. Can you switch to presentation mode? Um, better. Can you see now? Yes, I think we're not at the right slide, but yes, they're good slides. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I was seeing this on my, can you, can you see the whole, the whole slide now? I'm good. Everybody else okay with this? Okay. For me, this slide is cut off. About a third of it is missing on the right-hand side. I'm not sure why. This is Jen. See if I can hide this. Mm. 
How about now? Perfect now. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. So this just really quickly is the overview of the of the measure, the measures, functional measures in NCHEP over the over the three waves. So going into a little bit more detail, NCHEP estimated the uh, level of difficulty that participants had performing uh, various activities in, uh, of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living following pretty well-established uh, survey questions um, provided in the literature. The activities of living, daily living that were uh, included in the survey were mostly measures that we would expect um, and that as geriatricians and, and other clinicians uh, evaluating older adults would expect to find. The instrumental activities of daily living were also very similar um, with the addition of two questions we don't usually include, um, including driving a car, level of difficulty driving a car during the day and difficulty driving a car during the evening, um, which opens up the possibility of studying at least subjective level of driver safety uh, over time in older adults. To score um, a disability scale, again, we use the literature to help inform these scales. Um, most scales presented in literature uh, create a summed score um, by assigning a point for each activity that can be done independently or, or require at least some uh, difficulty or have some difficulty performing them. So you end up having a scale of independence or a scale of dependence. Um, and these have been pretty well uh, defined in the literature. Those references at the top can help guide with scoring. As far as the objective physical performance measures in NCHAP, the original wave, 2005-06 wave, uh, administered the three meter timed up and go test. It's a pretty classic uh, geriatric assessment tool used clinically and has great relevance to us there. This was conducted in the home setting using a participant chair uh, and a three meter piece of string that the interviewer laid out in front of the chair. Um, and then after a demonstration and a safety screen, the participant was asked to stand up from a chair, walk three meters at a usual pace, turn around, come back to the chair and sit down. The analytic considerations for individuals interested in studying uh, tug performance is that the public data set includes time for three intervals for the tug. The uh, first interval is recorded um, that uh, starting with the chair stand and ending as soon as the participant reaches the end of the three meters. The second interval begins with the initiation of the turn and ends as the participant reaches the chair. And the third interval records time uh, to sit down until the end of the chair sit. So there's three, three time intervals and they have to be added together to get the total time. Time in NCHEP was recorded in whole seconds. Scoring for the tug, again, is pretty well established in the literature. There are variable uh, ways to um, use tug time um, and various cut points. I present just a one that is commonly used uh, here where normal performance time would be um, considered anyone who can perform the task in less than 10 seconds or equal to 10 seconds, uh, delayed if they require 11 to 20 seconds or impaired if they require greater than 20 seconds. Starting in the 2010-2011 data set, the tug was replaced with two of the three subscales of the short physical performance battery, the three meter usual walk and five repeated chair stands test. The uh, three stance balance subscale was added in the 2015-16 wave. Um, the short physical performance battery is also a very commonly used um, clinical and research tool, and many on the call are probably familiar with this, but in case you are not, it was first introduced by Dr. Ralnick in 1994. Um, the three meter walk is done at its usual pace. The fastest of the two walks is used for scoring. Um, I've included the original scoring uh, on this slide. Um, 
And the original scoring results in a subscale that ranges from zero to four. A few analytic considerations for this task um, in NSHAP is that the original SPPB walk was eight feet and we used three meters. So it's a little bit uh, different distance, very slight. Um, and again, NSHAP recorded time in whole seconds rather than to the first decimal. The other uh, consideration is that prior to administering all three of these components, there were a series of safety questions um, asked to all participants. Uh, people who had equipment problems refused, were too afraid to do it. An interviewer or a caregiver who was too afraid to administer it um, would lead to someone not being offered this test and would help to create a category, a separate category of those unable to do that task. Um, and you can see that they can be included but have to be rescored um, in a separate in a separate category as those unable to do. I will also note that um, similar to the original SPPB, uh, NSHEP administered um, a three meter walk with a static start and stop so that the acceleration and deceleration phase of the walk are, are included in this time. The second subscale component included in NSHEP is the five repeated chair stands. The administration protocol and NSHEP follows very closely with the original short physical performance battery, um, which includes uh, a required single chair stand, a successful single chair stand performance before the five repeated chair stands is conducted. Um, again, the there was a safety screening uh, set of questions asked at the beginning, and anyone who had uh, safety concerns was not offered this test. People who were unable to perform the single chair stand uh, were not offered the five repeated chair stands. And so these people are all sort of can be pulled together as a single group indicating those who are unable to do that task. The five repeated chair stands is also scored in a zero to four range using the original scoring. Um, similar caveats apply here, um, including that the NCHEP scoring is in whole seconds um, and it's important to identify those who are unable to do as a separate category. Finally, the um, balance subscale in um, NCHAP was introduced in the third um, wave of data, which allows us to then sum the subscales to a total score uh, that ranges from zero to 12. The three stances um, used in, in NCHAP are exactly the same as those used in the original study, both the side-by-side, semi-tandem and tandem balances were um, delivered. The safety questionnaire screenings were administered before all three of those balance poses. Anyone who was unable to perform an easier stance was then not offered the more difficult stance for safety concerns. So the group who, um, again, who is unable to do requires a little bit of um, identification. Frailty uh, can be calculated using a, a variety of NSHAP data elements. Um, as most of you on the call know, there um, are a number of frailty tools uh, in the literature that we can use. Um, the, most, the two most commonly cited in the literature include the frailty phenotype and the accumulated deficits index, uh, first introduced by Dr. Freed and Dr. Rockwood in 2001. Um, I've included two citations here that um, uh, present uh, reviews of the various frailty scales that are available in the literature for your reference in case you decide to conduct or construct a, a, a unique scale. Um, I'm going to just walk you through an example of a frailty scale that we've uh, created and used in various studies. Um, we used uh, the, uh, or we created an adapted frailty phenotype scale. Um, the frailty phenotype um, es estimates impairment in five different criteria. Uh, the presence of exhaustion was determined by the respondents' answers to two questions that came from the NCHEP depression screening questionnaire. These uh, were very similar to the original used in the Freed study. Uh, participants were asked to estimate the frequency that they felt they could not get going in the morning or that everything was an effort to do. Anyone answering occasionally or most of the time was given a point. Slow gait was um, estimated using the three meter usual walk. Anyone scoring in the slowest uh, category of the SPPB subscale or those who were unable to do were given a point. 
Um, low physical activity in our adapted skill uh, came from a single self-report physical activity participation question in which participants were asked about the proportion of time or the number of times they uh, participated in moderate to vigorous activity. Um, anyone uh, performing or reporting that they performed these activities less than one time per month were uh, given a point for low physical activity. We did not include a grip strength in NSHAP like the original Freed study. Um, so we uh, introduced or used the chair stand performance as an alternative for that. To get a point for weakness, we, similar to the gate, we used the slowest time category as well as those were, who were unable to do. Weight loss was uh, calculated over a five year interval. Since um, the original Freed was estimated over a single year, uh, we increase the uh, criteria cut point to get a point for weight loss by requiring a 10% or greater loss over five years. Um, you can then categorize people as non-frail, pre-frail, and frail using a similar uh, five-point scale and categorization that uh, Linda Freed presented. Uh, just a couple analytic caveats that have come up in, in our work. Uh, the weight loss criteria requires that people participated in two subsequent waves. Um, and that can reduce sample size a bit. So we have studied uh, an adapted four-point frailty scale in which we um, just eliminate the weight loss criteria. Um, in addition, we know that the physical activity question um, was somewhat subjective and likely overestimated activity participation. Uh, so interested people could substitute accelerometry as an objective measure of physical activity. In 2010, NCHAP introduced um, a, a research-grade accelerometer. They use the ActiWatch spectrum in wave two in a sub-study. Then uh, in wave three, use the X8M3 mini in the entire data set, and we'll be using GeneActive uh, device in the wave four data collection. In all cases, the device was worn on the non-dominant wrist. Uh, it was worn continuously, including during water activities. And the duration of wear uh, varied a bit by wave. Uh, initially, uh, NSHEP required participants to wear the device for 72 hours. That was increased to 96 hours in wave three. Uh, the value of, of a wrist accelerometer in this case is that we use a sensor. We're able to use a sensor to detect non-wear time, and that's a real advantage to using wrist accelerometry. The wave two risk accelerometry is at least partially publicly available now in the data set. So just a little bit about that data for those of you who are interested in incorporating risk accelerometry. Most researchers using this data are interested in either um, evaluating sleep or evaluating activity. There are variables in the data set that indicate the rest start and stop time and the sleep start or stop time. These times can be used to segment the sleep interval and the wake interval, um, depending on your interests. There are also several sleep variables calculated for you in the public data set, sleep time, uh, awake time after sleep onset, both in minutes, and the percent sleep is also calculated for you. Um, the activity data is often um, uh, analyzed using uh, counts per minute. Uh, we have data in the wave two as, as granular as counts per 15 second epoch. So you can convert that to counts per minute. And from this data, generate a whole host of activity variables. Um, there are just a couple of analytic considerations. Um, again, classic for accelerometry studies. Uh, being able to identify valid days of wear from invalid days of wear, um, and including several important covariates for accelerometry, including day of week, month of wear, which will sort of help to adjust for natural variation in activity by day of week and season, um, and total wear time. So we've used this, um, this data in a number of studies. I'll just show you two brief examples. In this study, we wanted to explore whether uh, frailty was associated with different uh, activity patterns across the day. We used the wave two data uh, from NSHAP to explore this. We created an adapted frailty phenotype scale similar to the one I just presented. 
um, and use the wrist accelerometry data from the um, sub-study. We created a, sort of a unique activity measure for this study. We created a mean hourly count per minute, so for every uh, active, act, awake hour of the day, so each individual participant had multiple measures. We concluded a number of covariates. To study uh, the relationship between frailty and hourly activity patterns across the day, we used a mixed effects linear regression model in which the outcome was log transformed hourly counts per minute and frailty was the independent uh, uh, variable in the model. This model allowed us to include two random effects terms, one that estimated the kind of overall differences between respondents and hourly activity and another that allowed us to estimate the overall differences within an individual across uh, days of wear and hours of wear. And then important for, for this presentation, we also uh, tested uh, the significance of an interaction term between frailty and time of day. So our sample uh, represented a pretty broad range of, of older adult uh, physical uh, age and functional capacity uh, here, um, which made for a very robust study. Just a few select results in to share with you today. In our fully adjusted uh, model, we found that each additional frailty point was associated with about a 7% lower hourly activity across the day on average. Um, but interestingly, we found a, a very significant frailty by time of day interaction term. And when we replaced our hour of day factor variable with a penalized line, we were able to plot the uh, activity patterns across the day um, by frailty subgroups. And what you'll notice is that um, activity, uh, frailty is most differentiated by, by morning activity patterns rather than evening hour activity patterns. And this is in complete contrast to age, increasing age, which is mostly differentiated by afternoon activity. So in this study, I think it illustrates uh, um, the, the ability of NCHAP to study very clinically relevant syndrome here, frailty, and how it relates to uh, novel measures of mobility um, sort of explores, at least initiates exploration into how we can use this advanced technology to improve our assessment of frailty, um, perhaps in the free living environment rather than the clinical setting, but certainly more work is needed to, to, do the, to, to translate that into clinical care. Another example um, of this uh, use of the functional measures and activity measures in NCHAP is uh, a study we did a few years ago in which we wanted to understand how social, uh, how the social capital of someone uh, related to their physical activity participation. So again, we use the same wave of data, the same risk accelerometry data, but instead of calculating an hourly activity, we calculated a mean daily count per minute, which is sort of an average activity level. And then we included a number of social capital measures that uh, Dr. Cotwell uh, described earlier, social network size and various social engagement measures. For this um, analysis, we were interested in how the social measures related in cross-section to average daily activity and use a very simple multivariate linear regression model um, analyzing each individual uh, social measure um, as it relates to, to activity. And a brief few select measures here, um, we found that increasing network size and the increasing network proportion of friends uh, was associated with higher levels of activity. We also found that uh, more socialization, specifically visiting with neighbors, was associated with higher levels of activity. And we also found that people who were more uh, frequently participated in organized group meetings had higher levels of activity as well. So I think this study just uh, demonstrates, again, what we all know as clinicians, but have a hard time quantifying how important the social dimension of life is to older adult health. Um, and I think studies like NCHEP can really help us uh, identify very specific components of the social world um, and how they uh, impact health and, and really inform uh, interventions that we can then use to, to shape and support a healthy older adults' behaviors. Um, so, in sum, I think NCHEP really presents a great way to study the complex relationships between function, biological, and social health. We will have great uh, new, in, uh, interesting remote data in the wave four, uh, which I think will open up even more possibilities that are related to clinical care. 
um, and happy to answer any questions about, about this. Thanks so much for participating. And I will, I think, hand over to Bill for the next presentation. Okay, thank you, Megan, very much, uh, uh, and and Ashwin both for uh, you know doing a great job of not only describing the data uh, uh, for both cognitive function and physical function and accelerometry, but also for uh, you know illustrating how they can profitably be used. Um, I am going to uh, quite briefly, so that we have time for questions, I just say a few additional words uh, about some data issues and analytic issues with respect to these two sets of, uh, of measures. So uh, with the cognitive function measure uh, that Ashwin described, um, I'd just like to go through a couple of things, uh, some of these he had already mentioned. The first is there's very little item non-response uh, in the uh, cognitive function measure. Uh, and so that makes it possible really to, you know, to, to uh, do an analysis where virtually everybody in the sample is included. Uh, and uh, for some of the item non-response, it is so small uh, and the measure has reasonably good reliability uh, that you can, um, you know, simply impute or even just with an overall mean for the few items uh, that are missing for the few people that, that are there. It's, it's, a, it's a trivial thing that will make no impact on, on results. Um, as Ashwin noted, uh, we started using the MOCA essay or developed it for our 2010 data collection. Uh, and so at the moment, we only have it for 2010 and 2015. Um, and uh, and uh, there were some cognitive measures that we used uh, in 2005, uh, but awfully limited and really none that, that overlap appropriately. Uh, so you're, you're kind of limited to analyses for those two waves. Uh, as soon as uh, we have our 2021 data collection, then you'll have three waves available for that. Uh, the scoring of the MOCA essay is done centrally um, so that unlike the, the standard MOCA that's sort of typically scored by the administrator, um, our interviewers uh, record everything that the respondent sort of says or does with respect to the MOCA essay items. Uh, and all of that information is brought back centrally. Uh, and we have a team that's developed a protocol for doing this scoring, um, refined it, uh, and, and that's how they score, score the items so that we're not, you know, that they're scored systematically. Uh, and we can provide further details on that scoring uh, uh, if folks want. Um, and then finally, uh, Ashwin may have mentioned this, but NHANES uh, just added uh, the MOCA essay last year. Um, and so uh, data from NHANES should be shortly available. Um, uh, and this will, that they used our exact protocol that, that Ashwin described when they administered this. Um, and so those data will really add quite a bit. They'll cross-sectional, but they'll add quite a bit of value really to the NSHAP data. Um, simply in terms of, you know, confirming distributions and so forth. Um, with respect to analytic issues uh, and the cognitive function measure, um, <clears throat> you know, you can simply you 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 can simply add the items to to score it uh, in a procedure that's detailed in the paper that Ashwin referenced. Um, you can fit IRT models to it if you wish, uh, but they really add very little for most analyses that you would be doing. Um, as Ashwin mentioned, uh, uh, you can, uh, and we really recommend that you use the, sort of the full ordinal in, or the full, the full continuous information available to you from the scale. Um, and uh, I think we would strongly encourage folks, if you're modeling this as an outcome, to use some kind of ordinal model, an ordinal logistic regression model, for example, uh, uh, which um, is invariant to monotonic transformations of the distribution. So you can think of it as sort of a pseudo non-parametric model, uh, which is really quite flexible, and that, that's really the optimal way to model that as an outcome. Uh, Couple of things to think about. There's definitely measurement error in uh, the MOCA essay. Um, and so that means is, 
You probably know that when you're using it as a covariate, you're going to typically underestimate the true effects unless you unless you address that in some way. Um, and uh, and it also means that you know if you what you're doing is modeling the 2015 MOCA essay and you're tossing the 2010 MOCA essay into your model as a covariate, then you're going to tend to under adjust for uh, cognitive performance in 2010. So make sure to, to sort of uh, uh, pay attention to that, especially uh, when you're using the MOCA essay as a covariate. Uh, and then with respect to modeling change over time, which of course is, is what you know, many of us are, are really interested in, so that you can really capture age-related changes as opposed to some of the other kinds of things that may be associated with baseline cognitive performance. A uh, couple of comments. Uh, the first is that if you simply look at your average observed change from 2010 to 2015, this will, of course, underestimate the true rate of change over that period simply because uh, all of those who die or become too ill to participate in NSHAP are not reflected in that. Uh, and there are definitely ways to address that. Um, there are, you know, joint uh, survival longitudinal models that you can use here. There's very little that you can do, however, without making external assumptions or without external data uh, if you only have two uh, waves of data collection. And so uh, for all of the issues I'm mentioning here, as soon as our 2021 data become available, uh, there's going to be a lot more that you can do. Um, Obviously, if you're looking at that, you cannot estimate between just with 2010 and 15, you cannot estimate between person variability in the rate of change, um, which is, of course, interesting. You have to wait for 2021 for that. And then finally, you know, you really need to think if you're simply forming differences in cognition scores between 2010 and 2015, you really have to think about the edge effects there, meaning simply that if you're a person who scored, for example, very highly in 2010, you can't get any better. You can only get worse. Uh, and similarly for people at the bottom of the scale. Uh, and, um, and so you, you need to think about that if you're modeling just those differences. Um, with respect to physical function then, uh, um, uh, there is item non-response for some of the physical performance measures, and that is most definitely not random. Uh, people, for example, who are in a wheelchair can't do the, you know, the chair stands, that kind of thing, who use a walker may have problems. Uh, and so you can't just toss those people out. You need to think carefully about how they figure in your analysis. Um, the raw physical activity data. So um, the sleep data for 2010 are in the public data set that you can get through NACTA. Uh, the raw physical activity for 2010 are available upon request. We will add those to the data set at NACTA with our next uh, submission to them. Uh, and then the 2015 accelerometry data, as Megan mentioned, we used a device that we worked with a company to sort of develop for that. Um, and uh, what that's meant is that the preparation and cleaning of those data has taken longer than we had anticipated. Uh, we uh, are nearing the end of that process uh, and expect those to be available to folks by the end of uh, the end of 2020. Um, and that will include both su summary measures for both sleep and physical activity. Um, and then finally, um, you know, there are many of the same analytic issues that come up with respect to cognition uh, come up here as well. Um, uh, again, ordinal models are, are really fantastic for modeling the physical performance items and certainly far preferable to either throwing away information by dichotomizing or, you know, making assumptions uh, about the distance between uh, categories. Um, most of the, as far as the accelerometry data go, most of the summary activity and sleep measures can be modeled using standard methods, just as a continuous outcome, one or more, uh, or, or covariate. And um, and many of the papers that that have been done using these data already follow exactly that method. Uh, again, you do need to think a little bit about measurement error in that context. Um, uh, the raw, the actual raw data are quite large and, and intensive. They're, they're measured, you know, uh, in 2015 at uh, 25 hertz. 
Um, and so, you know, 25 measurements per second over uh, three to four days. Um, and so many people are not going to want to use those, but they are available if you want to use them. Deriving your own summary measures from that uh, typically requires pretty advanced models for that. And then finally, the accelerometry data is unique among some of our other NSHEP measures in that you have, in principle, three days and three nights worth of data, which allows you to uh, uh, model not only differences in the mean levels between people, but also differences in the variability and Megan has a paper that was just accepted uh, doing just that with the NCHAP 2010 data. Uh, so you can keep your eye out for that. And with that, I'll stop so that we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Phil and Ashwin and Megan. Um, Jen, I think, has been monitoring these questions. I think I'll just tell you, Gwen, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, we've had three questions come in uh, so far, and the first and second are similar. Um, they address the issue of how to account for changes in the measures over time. So for researchers who are interested in examining changes in cognition over time, how should they deal with the fact that cognition was assessed using different measures in wave one and the subsequent waves? And a very related question uh, for anyone interested in measuring changes in physical function over time, what is your recommendation for dealing with changes in the measures of physical function from the TUG to the SPPB? So oh, that's a great question. Maybe I'll just start off. I'll try and keep this quick and then uh, Megan and Ashwin can hop in. Um, uh, this is a problem. Um, and sometimes if you change a measure, but it's similar enough, you can either recalibrate or make adjustments so that you can actually fit sort of longitudinal models, even though the measure is changing. In the case of uh, the cognition measure in 2005 and then the MOCA SA in subsequent uh, versions or the TUG and the SPPB, which we moved to in 2010, that just is not possible. They simply are far too different. Um, and so at that point, you really only have two options. Um, uh, the first option, of course, is that you can perform different analyses. In other words, you can basically stratify on the measure as collected in 2005. Uh, and sometimes you can do that to good effect. Um, uh, you know, that's similar to sort of fitting a, a, a certain kind of a transition model. And, um, and so that's one option. The other option basically is just to treat the measure from 2005 together with the measures from 2010 and 2015 as simply a multivariate outcome uh, where you know, the variable from 2005 is correlated with the others, but is, you know, is measured on a different scale. Um, uh, and you can, you can sometimes, you know, get, get some, some good results with that. But those, unfortunately, for these two examples, I think are going to be your only options. Oh, and uh, actually, uh, if I could say one final thing, uh, I had one final slide, which I didn't show. But uh, we have a data and analytic listserv, um, which uh, which is available to folks. Um, I am I just chatted it to the full audience. You may go to that link and subscribe. Uh, uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, we discuss uh, uh, questions about the data and analysis of same, um, and you're all welcome to join and sort of join into the conversation. So. Uh, that is a good resource as well. We do have two more questions that have come in, but I'd like to offer any of the other panelists an opportunity to speak before I move on to two more questions. Okay. Uh, I don't, Jen, I don't have anything to add except one comment, which is that the SPPB components, the three meter walk and five repeated chair stands, after 2021, we will have three waves of of the same measure. So longitudinal studies get to be a little easier then. Thank you, Megan. There's um, the next question is, what was the rationale for changing the accelerometer device in subsequent waves? And I'm going to add the fourth question to that because it 
might it's kind of directed um, to the same similar issue for different accelerometry used for different visits have you compared their comparability between devices can we get change in accelerometer measured pa when with current data yeah i'll answer that very quickly um, the rationale for changing uh, is simply that this is a technology that is changing almost yearly. Uh, and so you have two choices. You can either stay current or you can use something that is, you know, uh, far less uh, less good. And so and so, however, we have now hit a plateau here and there will be really, you know, the, the changes in the future will be far less. The device used in 2010 was an old accelerometer that did not measure uh, uh, acceleration in three dimensions um, and didn't record raw data. Um, and the device that we sort of constructed and used in 2010 was a very early version of a sort of proper 3D accelerometer from which you could get raw data those same devices are now more or less identical to the one, in fact, manufactured by the same company in China that you have in your phone, that you have in other devices. And so actually starting in 2015 and going forward, um, the data we get, even though the device we'll be using now in 2021 is a more polished kind of device than what we used in 2015, those should be directly comparable. So starting 2015 and going forward, the form of the raw data and the way you'll be able to analyze them should be more or less identical. And we have done some validation internally on that. Um, unfortunately, going back to 2010, uh, some of the summary measures will be comparable, but the raw data themselves will be quite different. Thank you, Phil, uh, Jen. This is Louise Hockley. I'm just stepping in because we're exa we've exhausted our hour and we still have questions remaining. As you've seen in the chat window, um, we welcome you to connect to the data listserv so you can have those questions answered. We certainly are appreciative that you've hung in there for the duration, and I hope you come back and join us along with others who you think would be interested at our next session, which will be in two weeks' time. Thank you again, and have a good day.